Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, so we're just giving everyone a chance to um, to sign in. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get started soon. Um, but thank you everyone for coming um, to this September webinar, um, which is titled Gambling in and After Custody, Key Challenges and Insights from the Compulsory Drug Treatment Center. So in a moment, I'll introduce our speakers, um, but just as we're getting started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodianship and law of the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand. Um, we pay our respects for those who have cared and continue to care for country. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the Office of Responsible Gambling, who uh, fund the Gamble Aware program, uh, which this webinar is a part of. So just like to now introduce our speakers. Um, so firstly, we have um, uh, Denise Constantinou, uh, who is a forensic psychologist and the senior psychologist and team leader at the Compulsory Drug Treatment Correctional Centre um, at Parkley. Um, so she's been working with corrective services for 22 years now, um, including work with female offenders, young adult offenders and serious offenders. Um, and since 20, 2008, um, Denise has also specialised in working with drug-related offenders um, at the CDTCC, um, who meet criteria for substance use disorders. Um, so she's got a wealth of experience in this area, and we're really excited to hear from her today. Um, and then we're also hearing from uh, Karen Heinmarsh, or Kaz, who is the parole unit leader at the Compulsory Drug Treatment Correctional Centre at Parkley. Um, so she's had a frontline public service role uh, in uh, pro probation and parole for over 20 years, uh, including uh, eight years working as a social worker with Housing New South Wales. Um, so she's in her role as a parole officer. She's done work in the drug court, community service organisation, organiser um, through care and as the placement team leader at the Nunyara Transitional Centre at Long Bay. So I've thanked both Denise and Kaz for their time this morning, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what they have to say to us. So I'll throw over to you now, Denise, um, and we'll get started. Oh, thanks, Chris. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you, um, everybody, for your attendance today and just interest in uh, the work that Kaz and I do. And I guess, yeah, there is some overlap um, in terms of our client group, so hopefully we can share some of our experience with you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, which, hmm, hang on a second, why is that not showing now? No. Oh, goodness me. It worked. It just worked. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> um, if you like, okay. I can share the presentation and you can just tell me when to go to the next slide. Oh, that would be fine. Yeah, thank you, Chris. No problem. That's really strange. Oh. Yeah, why is it not? I could, oh, look, I mean. I'm oh, here gonna... it is. Oh, no. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay, so, oh, yay. Okay, I can see it too. Thank you. So, yeah, so today, I guess, yeah, we're going to be sharing with you some of our um observation and also some of the research in the area of gambling in custody. Um, unsurprisingly, and there's not a lot of research out there, but um, we'll share with you what we were able to find. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to go to the next slide. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, we'll start also with an acknowledgement of country. So we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we work today. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar also. So Kaz and I work on the lands of the Darug people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and future and recognise and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Thanks, Chris. So what we'll be covering today is, um, I guess, trying to share with you some insight into the experience of a person who is incarcerated. Uh, so what happens from the time of their arrest? I mean, I won't go into too much detail, but give you an overview. And also, you know, what the um, rehabilitation opportunities are for somebody who's in custody. And then Kaz and I will very proudly share with you a little bit of information about the program we work in, so the Compulsory Drug Treatment Program, 
And then we'll go into, you know, what gambling activity in custody um, involves, the prevalence, what it looks like, um, and then some of the consequences of that. And then Kaz uh, will take over actually from that point and we'll talk about the transition from custody to community, um, parole supervision requirements, and I guess that's where some of the overlap is also in terms of the work that um, you are doing and we will have opportunity for questions. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so for somebody who's been arrested and charged and had bail refused, they will be, they will find themselves in police custody or court cells and they'll be transferred to a correctional centre. Um, within, we are in New South Wales. So for those of you in New South Wales, we, uh, the centres, the remand centres that are typically taking or holding remandees is the um, MRRC, the Metropolitan Reception and Remand Centre on the Silverwater Complex and the Parkley Complex, which is, with, sorry, the Parkley Correctional Centre, which is on the same complex that the Compulsory Drug Treatment Correctional Centre is on. Um, but we're always very clear that they're very separate centres. Um, so uh, a new inmate will meet a reception committee and there'll be welfare screening conducted. And as you can imagine, it's a very distressing time for them. They've been separated from community and family. Um, and there's worry about everything they've left behind, obviously. So, you know, are they going to be left homeless or were they homeless? Um, but are they going to be left homeless? Jobs for some of them. Um, you know, are there children at home? Are there pets at home? All that. So, so we have welfare screeners who will identify those needs and have to, um, yeah, contact community-based organisations to, to assist with those. Um, you know, they'll find themselves being frequently escorted to and from court. It could be ABL, it could be in person until they're sentenced. Now, once the person is sentenced, a classification rating will be applied, which generally relies on, you know, sentence length and the type of offence. And placement in a correctional centre throughout New South Wales in our circumstance will be considered um, and so I've just noted there that there are actually 35 correctional centres in New South Wales of varying security levels. Um, so assessments are also conducted, and this is, I guess, you know, where the rehabilitation part comes in. So assessments are conducted, case plans are developed, and what we call a most appropriate program pathway. And that'll be determined by the assessed risk of reoffending within 12 months of release from custody. Um, what we call criminogenic needs, so the factors that would increase a person's risk of reoffending, and responsivity needs, which include things like motivation for treatment, um, literacy issues, mental health needs, um, anything that could sort of get in the way of them, um, yeah, getting the most out of treatment. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so programs. All the programs are evidence-based um, and CBT interventions. So those, I, I mentioned before the factors that may increase risk of reoffending. So we call those dynamic risk factors. They're changeable. So they're the ones we target for treatment. Um, and so some of those include pro-criminal attitudes that, you know, social interpersonal functioning, obviously alcohol and other drug use, mental health conditions, and the unhealthy use of leisure time. And then depending on the nature of the offending sentence length and the responsivity needs, programs are delivered for people on remand, short sentenced um, offenders and general offenders. So we have a suite of programs um, that will, again, it's CBT based, that um, targets general offending. And then there are some addition, additional sessions, almost like a program, they're like 20 sessions that would focus on, um, you know, propensity for aggression, domestic and family violence, and there's an addiction stream. Um, yep, thanks, Chris. So, but then we have those people who are assessed as being at a medium to high risk of reoffending, um, and they will go into more like higher intensity programs. So that's what the literature has told us, that the higher risk of reoffending then you need those um, higher intensity programs. So I think the general guide is 200 hours of intervention. So within New South Wales corrections, we have higher intensity programs for violent offenders, sexual offenders, drug related offenders, which is where Kaz and I come in, and violent extremists. 
So um, additionally, throughout the system, there's a young adult offender program for 18 to 25 year olds. And the idea there is obviously early intervention. Um, we have Aboriginal cultural strengthening programs and parenting programs. And then additional to the therapeutic programs, employment programs are offered, um, educational classes and chaplaincy services. And then throughout corrections, the healthcare is provided by the Justice Health and Forensic Mental Health Network. Thanks, Chris. And here we are. This is our um, Monday to Friday home, um, the Compulsory Drug Treatment Program. As I mentioned before, we're very proud of the program. Um, it's quite an innovation, although it has been around for, um, since 2006. So the difference with the Compulsory Drug Treatment Program is that it's a collaboration between the Drug Court of New South Wales, um, the Justice Health and Forensic Mental Health Network and Corrective Services. So Kaz and I are employed by Corrective Services, but we work very closely with those other agencies to provide holistic care to the drug-related offenders. So when the program was established, the intention was to provide treatment to the most entrenched drug-related offenders um, so they're, you know, high risk of reoffending. So they're generally the people who, you know, will be released from custody and they're back in within three months generally. Um, and prior attempts at treatment have not been successful. Um, so they may have even tried like the community-based drug court programs and, um, yeah, not, not completed them. So the referrals come through um, for our program, local or district sentencing, sorry, local or district court sentencing judge to the drug court of Parramatta. Um, and we're a 70 bed facility for male offenders. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so for a person to be eligible for our program, um, they need to have a sentence that is between like a minimum 18 months and a total of six years. So we do get to know our people very, very well. We work with them for a long time. Um, we do screen people out for firearms offences, um, sexual offending and uh, serious violence or drug supply. They're generally people who have longer sentences anyway, but the um, rationale for that is that they're probably more suited to going into some of those other higher intensity programs that I mentioned. Um, and our program participants also need to be living in or have a residence in and be sentenced in metropolitan Sydney because of the through care aspects of the program. Um, and then Justice Health will conduct eligibility assessment to, um, so a psychiatrist actually conducts assessment to determine whether the individual meets the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for severe substance use disorder. And we want to know that the offending is linked with the uh, severe substance use disorder and that there's no serious mental illness um, that could be a risk to themselves or others or impede their ability to engage in programs. Thanks, Chris. Chris? Next slide, please. Okay. Oh, suitability. That's us. All right. So this is where um, the team that Kaz and I work more closely with become involved in the assessment process. We conduct a suitability assessment. And again, we're looking at, you know, the history of drug use, their treatment history, um, the nature of their offending behaviour, and again, whether there is that relationship between drug use and offending. Um, likelihood of violence and domestic violence is very important um, because, as I'll go into later, um, our participants are allowed to access the community within their traditional non-parole period, um, which I'll explain a little further later. Um, so we also assess their motivation and attitude towards treatment, although we don't screen them out for it because it is our job um, to increase motivation or elicit motivation. Okay, we, we um, also assess their mental health and we have a think about whether their sentence can be converted to a compulsory drug treatment order. Um, and the most important consideration there is that our centre is minimum security. And so we need to know that they can manage their behaviour in a minimum security environment. Um, and again, whether community would be at risk if they're accessing the community within the non-parole period. And we also need to assess whether their participation in the program would be um, yeah, sort of place anybody else's um, safety at risk um, or whether there would be damage to the program's reputation if they were to enter. Thanks, Chris. 
Okay, so as I alluded to, the original sentence is converted to a compulsory drug treatment order. Um, and the person is then directed to serve their sentence um, within our centre, the Compulsory Drug Treatment Correctional Centre. So their program participation occurs under judicial supervision um, of the drug court judge who remains the Uber case manager. Um, we develop a personal plan with them, which is their treatment plan and contingency contract um, in one. Um, and the contingency contracting is based on rewards and sanctions. So they must meet the conditions of their personal plan to receive weekly rewards within the program um, and to progress through the program. Thank you, Chris. So in terms of progression, there are three stages of the program, which now I guess hopefully it's a bit clearer to you as to why we need that minimum 18 month sentence, because the three stages of the program are all a minimum six month period. So stage one is in closed custody and that's where we focus a lot of our efforts. Um, so we deliver our core interventions in stage one, and we're really working on improving their physical and psychological well-being. Um, yeah, parenting relationship courses are also facilitated, and urinalysis occurs twice a week. Um, in stage two, they would progress to what we call semi-open detention and have opportunity to start a gradual reintroduction to general community. Okay. Um, and so, you know, while we continue to support them to maintain physical and psychological well-being, we're now introducing social needs, okay, meeting those social needs. So they're reconnecting with family and spending time with significant others on the weekend. Um, now, from the centre, obviously they live in the centre, but they're going out to employment or TAFE um, or accessing community-based um, service providers, mutual aid groups, smart recovery, NA meetings and the like, um, and urinalysis increases to three times per week and their movements in the community are also electro electronically monitored. And then in stage three, which is again a minimum six months, it's hoped that they will maintain that schedule of meaningful activity and also the relationships with community service providers, but they will be able to reside in accommodation approved by the centre and the drug court judge. Um, and yeah, your analysis continues three times a week. And then yeah, if they're successful in completing stage three, um, then the drug court judge will be the releasing authority to parole. Um, and the other important point I think I'd like to share with you is that we also recognise that, you know, drug use is a relapsing condition, that, um, you know, I, I guess also we follow a stages of change model and in that way um, participants can also move between, like, back, like be regressed to a previous stage if there's been a non-admitted drug use um, and then we continue working with them to help them move forward again. So thank you, Chris. Okay, so in terms of our core stage one programs, um, we work with, well, we deliver a DBT skills program. Um, so mindfulness, emotion management, distress tolerance, problem solving skills and interpersonal functioning. Um, that's a 24 session program with sessions two hours per, uh, two hours per session. Um, and then we deliver a 50 session CBT program. Again, the, each session is two hours hours and that's an intensive cognitive behavioural therapy program that specifically addresses the severe substance use disorder and offending behaviour and the relationship between the two. Thank you Chris. All right so this is anecdotal I guess so we're working with severe substance use disorder it wouldn't be surprising to know that there's comorbidity um, you know well obviously with a variety of mental health conditions, but we notice gambling behaviour as well. Um, so what we've generally noticed is that probably about half of our program participants have a recorded history of problem gambling. And some of the behaviours we notice while they're in the program is that although the drug use has ceased and we've, you know, we've been able to manage the severe substance use disorder, there will be, you know, monitored phone calls where program participants are requesting family members or significant others to place um, external bets for them. Um, we certainly notice this when the NRL season begins um, and around state of origin. 
Um, we may also notice an individual's room well stacked with grocery items. So, you know, they're, they're acquiring a lot more than most. Um, when our stage twos are out in the community, um, we have occasions when we are notified by the electronic monitoring group that they've entered licensed premises in the community. And for stage three participants who then obviously are living in the community and have their mobile phone, there's access to online gambling um, on their phones. So it almost seems that when, you know, the reward pathway in the brain is not being as stimulated um, because of the absence of drug use, um, sometimes gambling behaviour surfaces. Um, yeah, thanks, Chris. So um, <laughs> this was uh, quite timely and concerning, but a little amusing. Um, when I <laughs> accepted opportunity to share um, some of our experience with you and um, spend time with you this morning, I worked into, walked into a common area within the Compulsory Drug Treatment Correctional Centre and found a table laid out with Monopoly money um, and a deck of cards. So interestingly, um, the program participants had recently requested more board games and Monopoly, um, but then they had, yeah, they weren't actually playing Monopoly. They were using the paper mock cash um, to, uh, yeah, I guess up the ante in their card with their card playing. So, yep. Um, <laughs> yes, next slide, please, Chris. All right, so what have we learned about the prevalence of gambling behaviour in custody? So um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, there isn't a lot of research in this area. Um, and, and, yeah, I guess that what I wanted to preface with was that, you know, some of the uh, precursors to gambling and behaviour are a little unclear. Um, so there was one study conducted in the UK or England specifically um, that had found no relationship between pre-incarceration behaviour in terms of the type of offence or prior gambling and in-custody gambling. Um, so no significant relationship, but there were a couple of other studies that indicated that for people who, you know, reported a lifetime prevalence of problem gambling, like within that group of people in custody that obviously there was a higher proportion who were engaging in gambling behaviour. Um, but overall, oh, sorry, it seems that gambling is more prevalent in custodial settings than in the general population. So, um, yeah, I was able to source some studies that were conducted in England, Poland and the USA, and there were ranges from 13% to 45% of the samples of male inmates who reported gambling in prison and on a regular basis. So the regular basis was either daily or a couple of times a week. Um, and at that lower end, the 13% was from the Polish study. And um, the suggestion there was that the lower rate may have been influenced by um, the inmates not under or having a different sort of definition of what constituted gambling because in their country or culture, apparently they're, you know, going more into like casino type gambling um, venues and so maybe didn't necessarily consider a card game in custody as gambling. Um, and also possible shame um, in, in report, self-reporting gambling in custody. Thanks, Chris. So gratefully, there was um, a study conducted in, well, there have been about six studies actually conducted in Australia. The most recent that I located was a 2018 study. Um, and so it was reported within this study that, yeah, prevalence rates among people in custody um, in terms of problem gambling has been between 12 to 52%. However, in the study conducted by Riley et al. in 2018, they actually reported um, a 60% prevalence rate for male inmates incarcerated in South Australia um, with a lifetime prevalence of problem gambling. 18% um, reported that their incarceration was um, related to problem gambling. And then um, the value of this study actually is that they then looked at risk for um, Aboriginal prisoners. Um, oh, sorry, Chris. <laughs> and then um, again, there was a significantly higher proportion of Indigenous Australians 
um, who reported uh, history or problem gambling, yes, yeah, 75% there, than the non-Indigenous who reported 57%. Um, and um, concerningly, I guess, for our Aboriginal people, um, they also reported half the rate of help-seeking behaviour. Thank you, Chris. All right, so what are some of the motives for gambling in custody? Uh, this was sort of across the board and, and certainly Kaz and I would see this. So general excitement to break the monotony of the routine. Um, you know, correctional centres can be very regimented and so, yeah, there was um, this theme throughout the literature, the limited literature, but a theme of, you know, that it brought a bit of excitement, um, positive leisure experience, so some stress reduction, I guess distraction, um, distraction in that way, um, gaining acceptance within the broader inmate population because um, those politics in custody and the dynamics are very challenging. So as a way to gain acceptance, um, some pressure possibly to conform and also where risk-taking is promoted, um, maybe to try and repay debts, um, to purchase goods and also to obtain status um, within the environment. Thanks, Chris. Forms of gambling in custody. So the most common is uh, are card dice games and particularly poker. Um, highly organised sports betting by small numbers of, of probably um, what we would call heavies. <laughs> um, own sports performance within the centre, performance of others. I mean, I'm going to say at this point that they will generally bet on anything, okay? Sexual favours, what happens on TV, you know, Home and Away is probably gets most of its ratings from people in custody. Um, fight clubs, unfortunately, not at the CDTCC, I'm going to say. We have a zero tolerance to violence. But um, fight clubs that occur throughout centres, um, you know, other people's behaviours. I bet you they're going to do this. I bet they'll do that. And the board games, Monopoly, Backgammon, Dominoes, Chess, um, table tennis, PlayStation tournaments. Yes, we do have a PlayStation in our centre. Thanks, Chris. The gambling currency is are generally food items so um, people in custody uh, do receive a pay and they can sp spend that pay on what we call buy-ups and they are grocery items and so that's generally what will be exchanged. Um, money in the form of IOUs, tobacco and again sorry to bring the sexual stuff back in but sexual favours um, can be another commodity. So um, the other concern is that, so as I mentioned, they do get paid for some jobs, so they have money available to them and that can be gambled. Um, well, they don't physically have the money, but again, they would purchase items of value and then be gambling that. But um, also they can put a lot of pressure on people supporting them in the community and those people in the community don't necessarily know what that money is for. Um, so the money will be deposited in an account with, with the correctional centre and then the inmate will have, uh, you know, access to that through formal processes. Again, they don't physically handle money, but, um, yeah, they can spend that money on, you know, putting money on phone accounts um, and also purchasing their buy-up. So there can be quite a lot of pressure put on community members. Thanks, Chris. Ah, so the risks. If you accrue gambling debt in custody... There are, yes, look, it's quite a predatory environment and failing to pay, repay debts um, can be very risky. Um, so, yeah, even accusations of cheating or resentment over losing bets can spark intense and violent confrontations. So there are threats of or actual physical harm. Um, there are parts of some correctional centres that offer what we call protective custody. So um, if somebody's accrued debt that they're not being able to repay and their um, safety is being threatened, they can request to move into protective custody, which greatly reduces their association with other incarcerated people. Um, you know, for some of them, they might only come out of their room for an hour a day uh, and into like an exercise yard. So some will not associate with anybody except staff members. Um, other will, others may get some time out of their cell but will, yeah, only associate with a certain number of people. Um, obviously, there's always a threat of death. Um, the, other, the other thing some people manoeuvre is that they will purposefully break a rule 
Okay, so breach the correctional centre rule um, so that they will be removed from the mainstream and then it might save more face rather than going to protective custody to be moved into segregated custody, so segregation, like they're being punished for, um, you know, being a bit more tough than, than weak. Um, yeah, or it could prompt them moving to a, being moved to another correctional centre. So, um, you know, there, there are many transfers through correctional centres, but um, there is still a risk with that because the drama can follow, you know. Um, inmates across correctional... Well, first of all, there are pretty frequent movements between correctional centres. And additionally, you know, inmates in different centres may communicate by mail, into jail phone calls can also be requested. So, you know, if somebody has, um, you know, screwed another person over, that can certainly follow them through the system. Thanks, Chris. All right, so how can we intervene to treat, reduce gambling behaviour in custody? I, You know, it was interesting to read, um, yeah, a study from, I think it was Canada, where, you know, a lot of the staff interviewed as well were sort of saying, like, we don't really know what to do about gambling behaviour in custody. So, but what we will say is that, um, you know, nonetheless, gambling behaviour is common and is actually quite an important feature of the underground economy of correctional centres. But as indicated, um, little is done actually to deter or prevent it. Um, so actually, it, yeah, here's this Canadian study. So a couple of the quotes from staff members there was that if they notice gambling behaviour occurring, that they may look the other way, um, give a warning or might investigate. Um, there was some indication that in minimum security centres, maybe uh, that if there were sort of sanctions imposed, that they'd be less likely to engage in gambling behaviour. Um, in that minimum security setting because they wouldn't want it to delay their release um, to the community and the like. But, um, yeah, otherwise there weren't a lot of deterrents. Um, some of the recommendations that have come out of the uh, literature is further screening and support to reduce gambling-related debt um, and providing a more appropriately stimulating environment because, you know, a lot of them are saying, well, there's not a lot else to do. Um, and so I think, yeah, probably the onus is on us, um, the people working in corrections, to um, improve the environment and, and give other ways for, you know, the use of time. Um, and then, yeah, within Australia, so that Australian study, the 2018 by Riley et al, um, highlighted the import importance of actually using the opportunity to engage high-risk incarcerated populations in effective treatment, given the prevalence, as we said, like it's almost half the population. Um, and for our Aboriginal people, including culturally safe targeted interventions. And this is where I'm going to give a big plug to Gamble Aware because at the CDTCC, we are so, so fortunate and highly value our relationship with Gamble Aware. So um, over the past few years, we've had one of your colleagues uh, coming into stage one and delivering the Cut the Chase eight-session cognitive therapy program to our program participants, which has been uh, fantastic. And obviously, once they meet your colleagues, there can be some through care in terms of, um, yeah, individual interventions when they can start accessing the community if it's indicated that they do revert to gambling behaviour. Thanks, Chris. And I'm going to hand over to Kaz now for what happens when a person is ready for release. Thank you, Denise. Yes, um, the cover that you've all just heard is the internal custodial gambling situation. I have spent most of my working career out in the community as a parole officer, also known these days as a community correction officer or a CCO for short. So the objective to an individual coming out in the community is community safety and to manage risk. So someone is granted a parole release date doesn't necessarily mean that they will be granted release on that date. The parole unit inside the custodial environment will submit a report to the state parole authority and it will be outlining all the programs and treatment the 
the um, par pending parolee has done inside custody, the risks that could potentially follow them out into the community and how community corrections can address these risk factors out should the, the parole be granted on the date. So if the State Parole Board agree to that, they would release the the parolee out into the community corrections office, wherever that location of the address for the, for their residency will be. And then a community correction officer will be allocated full supervision for the period of time and make sure that those conditions that were put to the state parole board from the parole unit are implemented out in the community to ensure the safety. So there's also another factor that um, comes into hand. Yes, there is an individual charge of an offence in the community. Sometimes they are granted bail for a pre-sentence report to be prepared in order for the magistrate to consider whether a custodial sentence or remain in the community to manage the risk is the better option. So in that instance, they will report to a community correction officer over the first six weeks of that report falling due. They will come into the office, home visits will be done, contacts with third parties will be made and a full comprehensive report will be given to the court to state should the offender remain in the community, this, this is what community corrections will implement to manage the risk, utilising both internal programs in the community run by corrections and also outsourcing to stakeholders such as yourself to assist with whatever the criminogenic risk factor is that found them there. So if they are granted a community order, you may often be dealing with clients that have a community correction order, which is similar to the old good behaviour bonds. It's now renamed the community correction order just for your own understanding. Or they could be granted an intensive correction order. An intensive correction order is probably um, one step before jail, but a little bit more intense than the community correction order. So when a parole officer obtains supervision, they will need to have a case plan implemented and that case plan will explain what the community officer is going to be doing to manage the situation out in the community. Next slide, thanks, Chris. So this is a standard example of a state parole authority conditions of release. And there's often the question as to why do the stakeholders need to give feedback to the supervising officer out in the community? And there is that highlighted portion there that they must, as a condition of their order, participate pro in programs, treatments and interventions or other related activities connected with their initial offending. So it is mandatory that the officer links treatment. If there comes a situation where the, this, the client needs to be breached and the matter returns either to a local court or the state parole authority, the breach report must implement what treatment was, was uh, linked to this criminogenic factor for that person in the community. Who was it with? Did they attend? Did they engage? Did they fail to attend? And all of those factors are considered in the, the final decision-making. Next, next slide, please, Chris. So if you have a contact or, or you've had contact from a community correction order officer looking for information about a communal client, you will receive, you should receive, a consent to release information form. And this is what it looks like from the community. It will have your agency on there. The community corrections officer does not need to know the fine details of your interactions with the client. They really just need to verify that they are attending as per your scheduled appointment. They're not cancelling and, and failing to show, um, that they are engaging well with you and are willing to address the factors. 
So um, we we need to have that verification to confirm that the case plan that we have implemented has been verified by the third parties in the community. Next slide. Okay, so some of the some of the clients that I've dealt with have had um, either a DV offence that's come into the community to be supervised, but when you read the police facts and then you speak to the the partner or the family, you'll find out that sometimes that domestic violence event occurred due to financial strain linked to gambling. So that will then be put in our case plan as to one of the risk and responsivity factors that needs to be addressed as part of the treatment in the community. There's also um, times where I've had a supervision of Bitcoin being used in the community and an individual losing all his possessions and then involving himself with illegal firearms to try and pay back some debts. And then there's also the money laundering aspect of um, using gaming machines in the community for outlaw motorcycle gangs or just gangs in the community. So during that time of supervision, as well as being linked into the third parties such as yourself, the parole officer will also be doing um, PGIs, which is what we call practice guide for interventions, which is not as intensive as what a, um, a professional treatment provider in the community would be offering, but it, it just gives more depth to the supervision and we'll be targeting, targeting for example, someone with a gambling um, factor. They'll be dealing with reducing impulsivity, increasing their self-awareness and managing high-risk environments each time they report. Um, so won't be done every single reporting time, but each each week when they report, it will target one of those factors. So you might also have clients come in to you and say, I don't know why I'm here. I don't have a problem. I can handle it, but my parole officer's here, uh, has made me come. And then you might also be thinking, well, this is wasting my time. I have other clients and this, this individual's denying that they have, have an issue. However, if you have been um, referred by community corrections, please bear in mind that that is a criminogenic factor linked to their initial offending and there is a means why that person is there, whether they admit it or not. If you have any questions around that, always reach out and speak to the um, supervising officer at any time. They'd be more than willing to work with you. Um, there's also a period of time during the supervision that sometimes the parolees or clients on community corrections or intensive correctional orders will have their supervision placed into suspense, which means they no longer need to report to us. But the reason for that is that we have linked and connected them with treatment in the community such as yourself. And it is an expectation as part of that suspension that they will continue to engage with self-help around, around their offending. So at any time, their order can be pulled back into the court system if they're failing to meet their end of the deal out in the community. So I hope that explains a little bit of um, the community-based supervision for you. I'll just hand on to Chris for any questions. So thank you, Denise and Kaz, for that, um, for that fantastic uh, presentation. I know that I sort of learnt a lot from as well, and I know hopefully some of our attendees have questions. So uh, for all the attendees, if you have questions, please write them in the Q and A box, and we'll get the um, Denise and Kaz to answer them as best they can. But I'd like to start off with some of the questions that I um, I had when I was watching um, your talk. So first, to Denise, um, you said for the the clients who are in that second stage where they're sort of out in the community a little bit and they, they have electronic monitoring as they're going out in the community and that it flags if they go into licensed premises. Um, is that just licensed alcohol premises or would that include something like a tab as well? Um, yeah, so look, it doesn't necessarily flag um, just in the walking into the location, but um, we can track their movements. So if there's ever any concern, if because when they are allowed the access to the community, um, it's subject to a legal document we call a leave pass that 
very like that really sort of stipulates where mm -hmm. they can go and with whom what times and also if there's any variation to that we are alerted by the um, external monitoring group mm -hmm. and then and that's when it would be indicated to us where they've gone and yes we would we wouldn't be supportive of any incarcerated offender with the privilege of accessing the community going into a TAB certainly not <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and and obviously from a from a treatment perspective, like so, it, it increases risk. Yes, but you know, if we're working with this person on you know for severe substance use disorder and they're substitute almost substituting that behaviour with gambling, mm -hmm. um, we would certainly want to be addressing that. Okay, well, you know, I was I was quite surprised as well with just how high the rates are of problem gambling uh, of gambling harm in prison because I think yeah, from the studies you said it was uh sixty percent of of the population. Do you feel that generally it gets as much attention within the um, within the criminal justice system as drugs and alcohol do? I don't, to be honest. Um, I'm aware, you know, when I talked about the reception and screening of inmates when they're received into custody, mm -hmm. there are questions within that interview. Um, so it's quite a structured interview. There are questions that target you know like do you have a history of problem gambling is it related to your offending all that sort of thing there used to be a program I believe called um the best bet I don't know if that's facilitated in correctional centers in general anymore mm -hmm. and um as I said I mean we're just very privileged to have you know gamble aware facilitating cut the chase and I think that also started at Park League correctional centre I know that I've passed mm -hmm. on some contact details anyway so so yeah I think it's great to be filtering it out um but my answer would be no drugs and alcohol certainly get more um well there are more interventions targeted towards that mm -hmm. yeah and perhaps that's something that yeah we as um as you know working in gam in the gambling setting that we need to sort of be more aware of because as I said that 60 percent rate is is extremely high um so yeah, um, it is extremely high. And the interest, oh sorry, can I just add? Like the interesting thing was from some of my reading, and I'm happy to share the journal articles, was that you know for some people, um, some people didn't have a history of problem gambling, but gambled in custody. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously there would be some people who have gambled in the community that don't gamble in custody. So it's really, diff I, I think we still need a lot more research to understand. Um, what you know some of the factors are that, that mm -hmm. determine but um, and obviously there's something unique about the, the custodial setting as well um, as we mentioned you know the lack of excitement <laughs> and yeah. um, you know a break to the routine is one thing um, but you know in some centres it was also talking about you know it's, it's reliant on how much inmates are interacting um, the physical space and whether there's room to, you know, I guess engage in a card game. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, it seemed as though there was more gambling happening in the more restrictive environments, like the maximum and me medium security um, versus minimum. That was interesting as well. And it's like, are they just sort of more meaningfully engaged in other things? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... There's a lot more research that needs to be done. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. Um, so, Kaz, I had a question for you as well. So um, I think one of the things that you mentioned there is um, the sort of very thorough assessments that's done um, when someone uh, is with community corrections um, and that comes up with the plan. Because one of the things that commonly um, we get told occasionally by clients who have been referred by their community's correction officers, like, oh, I just gambled once. And then the parole officer just said, oh, now you've got to go to gambling counselling for six months. And, and you know, you mentioned that, yeah, they often deny that they have a problem. Um, you know, I'm assuming you wouldn't refer someone to gambling counselling unless you thought, you know, it was a problem. It's not something that, you know, we, I guess we um, just have to sometimes take what the clients tell us, not necessarily at face value. I, I don't know, do you hear stories like that quite a lot? We do. We even hear it from drug and alcohol counsellors that state, um, I've done an, a, an assessment, there is no addiction, there's no problem, there's no ne need for relapse prevention, they're very stable, but they also are very good at, um, at times, some of them, influencing you to 
motivate the outcome for themselves. So, yes, they don't want to report to parole. They want to get on with their life. Um, they may often seem that that was a period of time when I was off the rails, um, but I'm better now. I'm working. I'm back with my partner. I don't want to have to deal with that anymore. However, it is linked to a time that you used your circumstances, emotions to manage a situation and it's caused you to come into the justice system. So, yes, if you have a referral from a correctional a community correction officer, it is definitely not to waste your time. It is definitely not linked to a one night playing the pokies or I've said that I occasionally used to put $20 in on payday. We would never utilise the services in the community that are so hard to get hold of these days and we appreciate that everyone is overcapacitated with trying to assist where they need in the community. Um, so it will always be very heavily linked to their offending. But as mentioned before, if the um, counsellor is not really sure with the conflicting information from the client versus the referral, just reach out to the corrections officer and they will give you a little bit more detail um, and the client would have signed the consent of release so they can speak to you about a more um, intensive depth to the charges and the history. Yeah, no, thank you for that. All right, so we're getting a few questions now through. So the first one is from, uh, from Mary and she wants to know, um, does compulsory drug treatment order issue when people release in the community or are they in custodial sentence only? I can answer that. Um, it only occurs when they're in custody. So um, they would be on remand for offences and then um, it's through the sentencing process that the referral can be triggered by the sentencing judge. So we're considered almost like a diversion from custody, whereas like custody is the only option for that person. Okay. Um, and and the, I guess, intention is that they come for intensive treatment with a hope of reducing that risk of reoffending and returning to custody. Okay, so it's sort of, yeah, so they would come to your program uh, sort of in, in lieu of custody, so to speak, as opposed to, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's right. But then obviously, um, yeah, then we work with them through the community reintegration. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so I've got another question. So this is from uh, Costas, who's one of our gambling counsellors uh, based in Ashfield, and he would like to know, I guess this is one more for Kaz, um, around legal obligations, our legal obligations as practitioners regarding clients um, on CCO orders um, who are ordered to attend gambling counselling as part of their treatment plan. Um, if the clients are ambivalent around their gambling behaviour and disengage, which, um, as you can all imagine, is very common, um, do we have to legally notify their CCO officer? Um, and as a voluntary service, how does how does this, you know, how does this work with us as clinicians? Because generally we operate as a voluntary service, but if someone's being mandated um, to attend, um, what are what are our obligations? Well, it's not a legal obligation from your side, but holistically it would be beneficial if you could contact their community correction officer, even though you are voluntary, a voluntary service, because we have told the court to leave Mr Jones out in the community as an option. We will guarantee that we will implement these strategies. And if the client is not engaging and you make us aware of that, we can give a written direction that they must continue to engage as per their, their conditions of the order. And, and they came to the agreement at the preparation stage of writing the report to maintain them in the community as an option that they would be willing to undergo these services. So they've agreed to it at, at the assessment. It's been put to the judge and the judge has implemented it or they've agreed to it in custody when the parole report was given to the state parole board that they would be addressing it. So they have to make and this is part of your freedom in the community. It mm -hmm. has to be followed through. So, yes, it's, it's a volunteer, but on our side they have made a, a legal obligation to the courts that they would participate. 
Okay. So I guess, yeah, it's sort of when you put it in that, you know, fuller context, it's sort of, you know, this person has committed a crime that's related um, to their to their gambling. And basically um, the courts or, the, uh, you know, the, um, the correction system more generally has sort of said, well, to reduce the potential of you reoffending, this is what you've agreed to do to do that. So I guess you've got to put it in that bigger context as well, that it's not just about the client, it's also about reducing their risk of reoffending and potential harm to the community as well. And whilst we're preparing sentencing reports and while the parole unit are asking us to go out in the home and check, check the living space, the people involved, the offending history awareness, we're always talking to third parties. It is part of their order as well that they give us the contacts of who they want us to talk to. We always need to speak to third parties and that is where we get a lot of our information from that builds on the case plan and the reasoning why we're referring to cert certain services in the community. Okay, fantastic. All right, so the next question is from Pat and they would like to know um, just what is the availability of spaces in, in your program? Like is, it, um, is there a wait list or... Um, are generally people able to get in? Do you know what? We're actually, our state is very low at the moment. Um, because our referral pathway is through the local and district courts, we've been very much impacted by the lockdown, the pandemic and lockdown. Um, everything slowed. To, well, first of all, I think there were less crimes committed um, in the pandemic and lockdown time, um, but also the courts really slowed down. And so there's a backlog in terms of um, people waiting for sentencing. And sometimes by the time they're being sentenced, they don't have the, and potentially the sentence being backdated, they don't have the time remaining to be eligible for our program. So that minimum 18 month period. Um, so there is availability in our program. Um, we're very much in a promotional stage um, and trying to get the word back out there through our legal aid colleagues at drug court to, you know, to the other courts. Um, if you know people who are facing um, incarceration and have, uh, you know, it's drug related offending, please mention our program to them and they'll have to speak to their solicitor about it. And hopefully the solicitor will flag it at the time of sentencing. Okay. Um, and just out of interest from my perspective is, is there anything similar, whether in Australia or that you're aware of overseas, that's very, that's like a, a a gambling equivalent, like a gambling, um, a gambling court or a gambling um, specific unit or anything like that? No, I don't. The only specialised courts, are, well, for adults, I'm aware of obviously the drug courts and that's sort of in, in various jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, yeah, like there are for juveniles and all as well. Um, but I'm not aware of anything specific to gambling. No, I'm not, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. But, right. but um, I did, I did want to add before, and we are talking about that um, relationship between gambling and offending, that um, we actually have a couple in our program currently who went straight from, you know, a poker machine um, to commit their offences. So yeah, there's a correlation. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. All right. Um, one of the questions we've got um, from one of our um, attendees is about um, they've noted that custody would be a great environment to talk to inmates about the remoteness of success when gambling, does the gambler wear cut, cut the chase presentation cover this? And I guess perhaps that's easiest for me to answer rather than um, either of you, because um, I'm, you know, it's been conducted, previously it was conducted by uh, one of our clinical psychologists, Michael Zhang, who has unfortunately left us um, about a year ago. And now it's been conducted by um, our psychologist, uh, Josh Batten, who's been doing it um over the past year and i will say that yes absolutely that is one of the things that that we cover in the uh the presentation groups that we do there so we talk generally about um cognitions related to gambling that um the uh, inmates may be holding we talk about how particular forms of gambling work we talk about um how to you know challenge gambling related thoughts that you might be having so yes that's definitely is one of the things that we do cover in in that program all right. Um, so Sandra um, wants to know, is there any follow up of people after they've completed the three stages of the um, CDTO program and they're officially out in the community? 
Um, you know, do you continue to follow up? I guess, you know, as a, someone based at a university, I'd want to know, you know, do you conduct research on how successful the program is longer term for people that have been through it? Um, what happens after the end? Yeah, so look, they, they transitioned to parole, which, I mean, has has shared a bit about, but I will say that um, we have been thinking about a stage four of the program for some time and whether we'd offer sort of booster maintenance sessions. Um, I've been trialling that with one client I've, I've worked with closely within the program and I've continued to provide some support and intervention post-program because um, he is still a corrections client. So I've been working with his parole officer, um, which has been challenging, to be honest, when he will relapse, but it seems like things are getting back on track now. Um, in terms of evaluation, though, I do have some exciting news because there have been some evaluations of the program, uh, I think 2010, 2013, I think, presentation. Um, so there was a um, Australian Research Council on ARC um, grant for research and a um, BOSCA evaluation in 2010. Uh, so that there were, you know, very promising results from that. Um, we administer a battery of psychometric tests, pre-treatment, end of stage one, end of stage two, end of stage three. Um, we've now reached 60 treatment groups since 2006, and we have all of that psychometric test data, which literally two to three weeks ago, we've handed over to the, re the corrective services um, research unit. Uh, so we're just about to commence an evaluation of the program, um, the largest so far. Um, initially, actually, what we're looking at is just validation of the assessment tools that we've been using and whether what they're measuring matters in terms of the risk of reoffending. Um, but yeah, then obviously, um, yeah, there are many places we can go from there. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of data um, ready to be analysed. Okay. That, and maybe that's a question, but if any researchers are here in the audience, um, maybe, you know, have a think about if that's something that you'd be interested in. Um, all right, I just have a, another question from Mary about, I guess, the um, the drug testing and the urine tests that, that are conducted. So um, I, if they're, first of all, if they're supervised, which I'm assuming they would be at definitely well um, clients with custody. And basically what happens if drugs are detected? Like is someone out of the program or, you know, do they have warnings? How does it work? Yeah, so um, because we work with rewards and sanctions, there are sort of some different consequences if the person admits their drug use versus not admitting it. Mm -hmm. um, but as we mentioned, the, the drug testing is very frequent. Um, we have on-site indications that we can make some decisions, like management decisions based on, um, but then those samples do uh, are transferred to a laboratory for, you know, more conclusive testing. Um, so generally, yeah, a, a program participant will be held in, like if they're a stage two or three, so they're accessing the community or living in the community, they'll be held in the centre. Um, they are held in the centre for up to two weeks, depending on whether it's admitted or not. And that is based on really medical knowledge in terms of um, neurologically and physiologically returning to a homeostatic state um, following the introduction of drugs to their body. Um, and then a regression period to another stage, like if they're a stage three living in the community, they'd be regressed to stage two for a six week period. Okay. Um, so the first two weeks they'd stay in the center and then the following four week periods period, we would um, commence that community reintegration again to prepare them to return to stage three. Okay. Um, I will give you one stat. So about two years ago, we reached 80,000 urine samples collected and illicit substances have been detected in two to three percent. So we're very, okay. very proud of that. All right. So that's, yep. that's, that's quite a great, a great result. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. So we have a question. In from... addition to. Yep. Oh, sorry, Kaz. Oh, sorry, Kaz. Oh, sorry. Just in addition to that question, out in the community when parolees and community um, clients on community correction orders, intensive correction orders are being supervised, they are actually drug tested. It's not a supervised urinalysis. It is a drug swipe that is done in front of the officer on the tongue. Um, that is not sent to the lab. There is an instant result, which is very similar to police roadside testing. Um, the difference is ours shows benzos 
as opposed to police because a lot of the clients are prescribed mental health medication. So we have that coming up on our, our screening. If, if there is any challenges, it end up, ends up being another type of um, swab from the collection of saliva and that will be sent off to the lab for further testing. However, gone are the days where a drug use equaled a breach. We are not that punitive anymore. Corrections have now taken the stance that we are change agents. So to implement change, we need to support, link, connect to, to services that can better thrive that person to move forward in life. So a drug use would be you have to be ensuring that client is getting treatment and they're willing to go to treatment. doesn't necessarily mean they need to go to rehab, but just to be linked into some sort of intervention in the community to address that. If they're demonstrating that they are still struggling, they're still showing positives, however they are still getting treatment, that will be managed in the community these days. If there is continuous drug use and failure to engage with treatment in the community, that is where the breach action will commence. Okay. So it's not like a, a zero tolerance approach that, oh, you have drugs, boom, you're back, um, you're back in. It's really taking the approach of, okay, how can we help you? Used to be. Yeah. No. Exactly. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, another question. Um, do either of you have any data or experience as to clients who have commenced gambling while in prison and whether they've continued um, within the community and required intervention? I don't know whether that's anecdotal stories or um, any data where, you know, it's something that they've picked up gambling habits from some of those um, gambling activities you're describing in prison and that's carried through. Um, have either of you had any experience of that? Um, I don't, I, I, I couldn't say, um, but I'm trying to remember which research paper I read and of the sample, I think it was a, a like 8% mm -hmm. had not gambled before incarceration, but were gambling, um, in custody. Um, and I'm not going to say that that's representative of, you know, sort of, uh, uh, general, um, population of incarcerated people. Um, but yeah, I would say it's a lower rate and, and I imagine there would be different motives then for why they're engaging in the gambling behaviour in custody. Like it might be more of that to fit in type of stuff. Um, and whether it continues after, I, I couldn't say, to be honest, I'm sorry. Um, I think anecdotally what I could say is that we have noticed that increase in gambling behaviour on occasion um, when the substance use disorder is being managed. Yeah. And I guess there's also the, you know, because I guess it's also true that sometimes some behaviours and um, habits that are picked up in, in prison may not continue once someone's out of that environment because some behaviours are very, I guess, context specific. Exactly. Yeah. And there, yeah, there was that um, piece around what, what are the characteristics of the custodial environment that, um, increase the likelihood of gambling activity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, which may not, yeah, like you said, wouldn't necessarily be present um, post-release. Okay. Yeah. All right, um, so we have a question from Carmen, one of our psychologists, who's wanting to know, um, is comorbidity management implemented in the CDTP once problematic gambling is identified as a second presenting issue in conjunction with the primary AOD issue? Um, and what, do you have um, specific clinical interventions that are provided to First Nations Australians considering the very high rates of problematic gambling that have been identified? Um, in terms of the comorbidity and intervention, I have to say we are relying on our gamble aware specialists really to provide it. So as I mentioned, you know, the Cut the Chase program is offered in stage one um, in parallel with our RUSH program, the DBT Skills and the CBT Pathways program, and they complement each other very, very nicely. So I, I'm really pleased of the fact that we can offer that intervention in closed custody. 
and then we monitor for possible gambling behaviour during community reintegration. And, you know, we have a program participant currently who has established a relationship with Josh through the group in stage one and he's now seeing Josh individually um, at his office um, because he's in the participants in stage two so he can access the community. Um, in terms of the cultural lens, I'm going to say, no, we don't have anything specific for Aboriginal people. Um, but we are working very closely actually currently. I mean, Kaz and I were in a meeting on Tuesday morning um, with an Aboriginal elder. Um, so, so he can start some cultural strengthening programs within the centre um, and also work with our uh, Aboriginal program participants to develop a cultural plan that sits alongside their personal plan. So we're certainly looking at ways to increase our um, cultural safety. Um, specific to gambling, again, because I, I think actually there was an Aboriginal gambling program, program for women in Western Sydney, was there, Chris? I'm pretty yeah. sure there was yeah. through your service. Um, so I think then, yeah, we would be referring, I mean, obviously our clients are men, so we wouldn't be sending them to that service. But um, again, it would be about once they're in stage two, um, accessing community-based services. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So I've got a follow-up question for Kaz from Costas who asked the question before about the um, ethical issues regarding um, reporting to the CCOs. Um, so Costas is reporting that he has two clients who have been, um, who have told him that they've been referred to him through um, their CCO and the court. However, they haven't received any correspondence. Um, how do you find out who someone's CCO is and how to contact them? Or do you need to get that information directly from the client? Um, sometimes you won't hear directly from the CCO. They'll have a list of resources in the community, of the office location that is offering um, support and that client might just be referred or told that they need to take their own initiative and reach out into that that service. Um, I would probably suggest that you speak to the client and ask who their officer is if you would like to contact. But at the same time, as part of the case plan, the officer should have details of, I have referred to um, gambling support counselling with whatever agency it is and who the contact person is, and they are actually meant to be reaching out every two, two to three months to that service provider to verify, confirm, and, and to add that to the to the case notes and the case plan. So, yeah, it's, it should be, there should be contact being made directly to you from the, from the CCO. It's unfortunate okay. if it's not happening. Okay, so um, so if it's not happening, probably the best way is to talk to the client directly and get the CCO's details. Yeah, or whatever the address is of the client, the local office would be, if you just put in Google report, say Guildford, and it'll tell you what office, Bankstown, CCO, and just call and ask who supervises, you know, Mr Jones, and they'll put you through. Okay, all right. Thanks, guys. But it actually shouldn't be happening that way. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so I've got two questions that I guess are somewhat related, one from Sandra and one from Kim. Um, so both seem to be related around um, uh, eligibility for the CDTO program. Um, so Sandra's is around mental health conditions. So if a mental health condition excludes someone from the program, um, are they diverted into other programs? Um, and Kim's question is about firearm offences. Um, so if someone has um, committed a firearm offence, would that exclude them from uh, a program like the CDTO? Okay. Um, in terms of mental health, um, I probably need to clarify that it would be an untreated mental health condition that would exclude, so exclude somebody. Um, and considering so our um, eligibility screenings are conducted by a psychiatrist, so if there was concern about a person's um, mental health, then intervention could be provided then um, and to a point where hopefully they would reach stability and be able to come into the program. But if that's not achievable, um, yes, so there are 
are. There's a mental health screening unit on the Stillwater complex. There's the Long Bay Hospital, for those of you who are in New South Wales. So there, there are facilities within corrections um, where people with, you know, untreated mental health um, can be stabilised um, and, and provided treatment. Um, you know, on occasion, we've had people in the program, potentially if they've engaged in some methamphetamine use or something, who have had a psychotic episode and had to be removed from the program for short term, stabilised, and some have managed to come back, although some have come back and then remained unwell and, and then had to be revoked from our program um, so that they could go into one of the mental health units. Um, the second question, oh, sorry. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so if someone, for example, had a diagnosis of, say, um, bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, but they were on their, you know, it was well treated, it was um, stable on medication, that wouldn't preclude, preclude them from coming? Definitely not, no. And our psychiatrist visits the centre weekly, so there's all of that, um, you know, monitoring uh, and, you know, revision of medication regimes and things like that. So, again, I think that's one of the benefits of us working so closely with Justice Health. Um, yeah, so we've got specialists visiting weekly. Uh, the other question was about firearms. And, look, I yeah, so use of a firearm in an offence um, automatically exclude somebody because that they would probably be more suitable for the violent offender therapeutic program mm -hmm. um, within the violent you know within those other intensive programs because obviously drug use is rife amongst, amongst offending populations but um regardless of the intensive program that they go in there is that opportunity to address I shouldn't say regardless for drug use, but for, for a sexual offender or a violent offender, they would still get some drug and alcohol treatment in those intensive programs. Um, but it, that would be considered like a treatment priority in terms of the risk to the community, I guess, um, and where the intervention would want to be focused. So in saying that, we've had people come in who have used blood-filled syringes during their offences, um, knives, all that sort of thing, but um, and maybe even a replica gun. Um, but but use of a, a an actual firearm is an exclusion criteria. Okay, so but it's not that people who had would be not able to access other programs. It just wouldn't be appropriate for this specific program. Exactly, that's right. Yeah. All right. So I've got oh, it seems like more of a comment from Marcus, who is from um, AGSS, which is the ACT Gambling Support Service. Um, so he comments that as a lived experience gambler, uh, he goes out into correctional facilities and runs gambling harm awareness groups through a lens of co-occurrence between alcohol and drug use and gambling. Um, and notes that this is important pre and post. So I guess to make that into a question, do you, um, as part of your program, do you hear from people in the community with lived experience or is it very much focused on treating professionals? We would love both. Uh, actually, um, but but we don't at the moment. No, we don't have anyone um, coming in with lived experience. Like we've had, um, I guess, you know, in the drug use stream, we've had people from Smart Recovery, we've had people from NA and AA coming into the centre and talking about their experiences. And we've also just had like motivational um, speakers, you know, people whose lives have been, um, you know, all their trajectory has been completely completely altered by accidents and, and the like, mental health, those sorts of things. But nobody specific, oh, actually, we also have a good relationship with um, Hepatitis New South Wales and they bring a lived experience speaker with them. Um, but we haven't had anybody talk about gambling harm. Um, so yeah, I think that, that, to that, that might be a watch, this, a watch this space comment because we do um, we do have uh, a peer support program starting soon in New South Wales. So hopefully as part of that, um, we will be able to, um, you know, Brilliant. bring everyone in. So um, yeah, maybe it might be watch this space. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right. And just one final question from Mary. So um, she mentioned um, weekly rewards as part of treatment. Um, within the service. So what sort of rewards do you use? Is it that sort of grocery items you were talking about before or? Um, that's how it starts off. So in stage one, the rewards are individual and community. So, and they are around food. Um, and the rationale for that is that, you know, we've removed a very, you know, immediately rewarding um, behavior. 
And so we want one that's almost as reinforcing and that seems to be food. Uh, so they have a list of like Coles grocery items that um, they can, they, they start at like a $1 amount and can work up to a $12 amount um, depending on weeks of compliance with their personal plan conditions and obviously abstaining from drug use. Uh, and so they can spend that on a, a Coles food item that we then order online and distribute later in the week. Uh, the community reward is that if the whole of stage one community is drug free, then we have a um, community reward lunch on a Friday, which is typically a barbecue, um, which staff participate in as well. But when they move into stage two, the rewards become social. So mm -hmm. that's where the weekend leave comes into it. And um, yeah, like, so we meet their families or significant others. They nominate sponsors who are pro-social support people. And then, um, yeah, they start spending time with them on the weekends. And that commences from anything from a two hour leave to full weekend leaves towards the end of stage two, where they stay over on Friday and Saturday evenings in approved accommodation. And then the big carrot is potentially moving into stage three community living within what would have been their non-parole period. Okay. Yeah. So it's yeah. it starts off little things and then can be actually quite quite good rewards, it sounds like. So absolutely. All right. Um I, mean, I I just had one final question. Uh, so Adrian, um one of my colleagues, he sent through a question and I guess it about how um the bedding syndicates within prison work. And I guess that my question is, you mentioned about, so would people be betting on things like, you know, do they have organized sports events within prison that they bet on? Like, I don't know, racing each other or boxing matches or things like that. Is that the sort of things that we're talking about? Um, they be betting on there are, yeah, like there are um, yards where they can play, you know, touch well, I'm not going to say rugby league I'm not going to say they're allowed to tackle each other but yeah like a touch football type of thing um cricket they're a basketball court like even actually in the MIIC they have a beautiful half basketball court um so yeah there is opportunity for those types of activities and what I will say is that um sometimes the networks are linked to people in the community so um, there can be, month, like, so, you know, you might hear someone on the phone and they're asking a community member to deposit money into some random account in the, you know, another random account in the community, and that's money owed to a person known to another person in Kazi. It's very complex. Hopefully that's not too confusing. But yeah. they communicate through people in the community and they're handing over, like, bank account details and things. So there are deposits made externally. Um, so it's sort of the, the network's quite large. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And yeah, I just want to share my thanks and I'm sure thanks of everyone here attending, um, to, to both Denise and Kaz for their time today. It's been very, very informative and I've got a lot from it and I hope that everyone else attending has got a lot from it as well. And thank you both so much for taking the time to come and talk to us today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, Chris. I was just going to mention that at the end of our slide, um, we just had the list of references and um, email addresses for Kaz and I if anybody wanted to reach out. Yeah, so definitely I'll be sending out the slides to everyone today as well. So if there's anything that you wanted to go back and read again, if you had any additional questions, um, you can contact Denise and Kaz if, and there's also a reading list of um, papers that have been published on the topic. So for those of you that are interested, that'll be on the slides, which I'll I'll send out in the next few days alongside the, the recording of today's session. Um, all right. And so I'd also just like to, again, um, remind people that our next journal club will be held on the 19th of October during Gamble Aware Week. Um, it will be an in-person event, so it won't be a webinar. We will be recording it, um, but it will be um, accessed in person at our the, the Brain and Mind Centre in Camperdown. So I'll send out the link to everyone as well so that you can register to attend. It's going to be focused on gambling in newly arrived communities, so uh, coal communities, refugee communities, um, and we're going to be co-presenting with the multicultural gambling service. Um, so, you know, please attend. There's gonna be a light breakfast served with that one as well. So that's gonna be on the morning of Thursday, the 19th of October. 
So just another thanks again to Kaz and Denise, and I look forward to seeing you all at the next uh, Journal Club. Can I also just thank say you. a very big thank you, and please continue your good work. So thank, thank you. you. I'm getting lots of lots of thank yous in the comments from everyone as well. So thank you guys. It Absolutely. was a really great talk. All right. See you.